This morning we will consider these lessons for this Sunday, Christ the King, our first lesson from Jeremiah chapter 23. Mismanagement, illegal activity, poor leadership, perhaps you've seen these things in action. God sees poor leadership in action from the shepherds of his people, so he promises to do something about it. He will send a new leader, a king, to save and deliver his people. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king, who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson today from Colossians chapter 1, here the Apostle Paul describes this king, King Jesus, who defeats all enemies and rescues us from the darkness of this life. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among, from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Alleluia! I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Alleluia! This morning we consider this gospel lesson from Luke chapter 23. In this lesson, Jesus is mocked and sneered at, but he shows himself to be our Savior and our King. The people stood watching, and even the rulers sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him, which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We'd like to invite the younger children forward today for today's children's message. And then after the children's message, we'll join in the hymn of the day. It's number 341, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Good morning. morning, everyone. Thanks for coming down today. I have a couple of special things to show you. 
um, as we celebrate this Sunday called Christ the King. So here's the first one. Does anyone know what that is? Do you know what it is? Yeah, it's a cross. It's a cross necklace. And if you look at it, it's sort of a special one. I wear this sometimes during the Lenten season. Can you take a look at this part of the cross? What does this part right here sort of look like? Does anybody know? Do you know what it looks like? Looks, yeah, it looks like it could be a sword, yeah. Or it could even looks like... A spear or a sword, those are both good answers. Yep, I was looking for a different answer, though. <laughs> a nail, there you go. It looks kind of like a nail, doesn't it? Um, any idea why they might have made a cross that looks like a nail? Because they nailed Jesus to the cross. That's exactly right. So so this cross, this cross helps us to remember that Jesus was nailed to the cross. Now today, I'm wearing a different cross. And it's also on the slide if you want to advance that one too. Look at that cross once. How does that cross different than this cross? How is it different? One is it's gold, yes, that's, that's one, good. Another one? Jesus is on this cross, right? Just like he's on that cross, too. We call that a crucifix if Jesus is on the cross. That's exactly right. And if you look, there's one other special thing on it. Look at Jesus' hands. Can you tell? Yeah, they're actually, on this cross, they're not nailed anymore. Do you know why that is? Do you know why they're not nailed on the cross anymore? Right, because Jesus rose again. And this sometimes is called the risen Christ cross. It reminds us that Jesus died, but he also rose again. And today Jesus is in heaven. Think about that. Jesus is in heaven right now, and he's watching over us. And he's there to help us. And it's like his hands are raised in a blessing. And he wants to bless us in our lives. And that's why today we celebrate Christ the King. That Jesus is the King of everything. And he lives to bless us with his love. So when we have problems and troubles in this life, we know that we can always go to him because he's alive and he's living to bless us. Let's close with a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus we thank you for dying on the cross by being nailed there for our sins. We also thank you for rising and being in heaven today and listening to us right now when we're talking to you and living to bless us. We need your blessing every day because our lives are filled with many, many troubles and we need your forgiveness and peace. So we ask you today for your blessing as we worship you, Christ our King. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning we'll consider these words from Luke chapter 23. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. This is the word of the Lord. Your friends in Christ. Did you listen to the news at all this week? It's really kind of hard to miss, wasn't it? And everything pointing in the same direction. Maybe you heard a little bit about this country, Ukraine, where the red dot is there in Eastern Europe. Did you hear about this at all? A lot of discussion about allocation of funds and was everything appropriate, all pointing in one direction. Then there was more talk that came out of this too. Did that country or another country, or maybe a whole number of countries, 
attempt to affect our election in 2016, especially one specific office. Then there was additional things that came out on Thursday with another debate. Ten candidates on stage all sharing their ideas for the country. And then there's word that maybe there's a couple of other candidates that want to enter the race as well. And then I did a little bit of reading and I discovered that already up to this point, candidates have received over $500 million for this. And it hasn't even really started yet. They're all pointing in the same direction. Do you know what it is? The executive office of the President of the United States. Just about everywhere we turned this week, someone was talking about the President and the office of the President. And as I listen to some of those things myself, I realize that it's really with good reason. Because there is an amazing amount of power that the president has, whoever the president is, to influence decisions, to just make decisions, to allocate funds. And now not only do we see that that affects people in our country, but affects people all across the globe. And the other thing that became very obvious this past week is that when you talk about the president, again, no matter who the person is, there's a power struggle that's going on. There's a struggle among the people. There's a behind-the-scenes struggle in the media. There's a struggle maybe all around the world because there's so much power. And people want that power. But there's one thing that also is obvious and evident. That as powerful as that position is, there's one thing that the office of the president cannot do. And it has nothing to do with ambassadors or the allocation of funds. So today, as we celebrate Christ the King, we'll focus our attention on these words in Luke chapter 23 and think about who is your king? You know, today we talk about power struggles, but really in a lot of ways, that's nothing new. In our lesson today, Jesus is on the cross. And there's a reason why he's on the cross. It's because the people of his day decided ultimately to get rid of him, at least in a human way of looking at it. One of the power players in today's lesson are the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders of the day were wealthy, and they were powerful. They had a lot of influence. And that's why they didn't like Jesus. Because when Jesus came on the scene, people started to listen to him. The, the Bible even says he taught as one who had authority, not like the teachers of the law. People started to follow him. It started to undermine their power. So there was a plot afoot. We need to get rid of Jesus. There was some money that exchanged hands. 30 pieces of silver to Judas to betray him. Then there was a little riot that got started even. You remember this? When Jesus was before the governor, the Jewish leaders stirred up the crowd to shout, Crucify him! Crucify him! Yeah, something was evident with these power players at the time of Jesus. They decided their lives would be better off without Jesus around. And now when Jesus is on the cross, 
It says the rulers sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. Kind of the final nail in the smear campaign against Jesus. Of course, they weren't the only ones. The other power players of the day were the Romans. And in some ways, they really had the power. We think, for example, of the guards. Those guards that were entrusted with the life of Jesus. Even the soldiers, it said, mocked him. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And of course, these soldiers were only just carrying out the orders of another man. You know who this is, right? Pontius Pilate. Pilate was the governor of the area around Jerusalem. He was really the one who had the final say. But that's really where the power play really comes into focus. Because he was interviewing Jesus and, and he wanted to let him go. But it says that when he noticed that there was a riot that was starting, well, you don't want word to get back to Rome that in your area there's a riot. So what did he do? He said, we'll whip Jesus and then we'll let him go. But the people kept shouting, no, crucify him, crucify him, stirred up by the Jewish leaders. Pressure was mounting. He said, well, we always let a prisoner go. How about Barabbas or Jesus? Whom would you choose? They said, give us Barabbas. Well, what should I do with Jesus? Crucify him. And the pressure was mounting. If Pilate lets this get out of hand, he could lose his power. He could lose his job. Pilate came to a decision. Life would be better off without Jesus around. So he washed his hands of it and sentenced him to death. But he didn't do it before he put this on the cross. You've seen these letters. They're actually the same letters that are on the cross there. I-N-R-I. Seen those before? Those stand for the Latin words. Jesus Nazarenus Rex Iudi Aorum. In uh, the Latin language, there's no J, so you could probably figure out what that means. Jesus the Nazarene or Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. He put that over the cross because they would often put like what your sentence was. Like, what were you convicted of? Like it might say thief, or it might say murderer, or rapist. But Pilate was making fun. He was mocking. He was really mocking the Jews say, I'm killing your king. There was a power struggle that was going on. And Jesus was right in the middle of it. Do you ever find yourself in a power struggle? Do you feel these things going on? You ever seen that at work? Some people on one side, others on the other. You see these things going on in the community. There's a power struggle. Everybody wants power. Jesus here is seen as a threat. He's a threat to the Jews' power. He's a threat to the Romans' power. Is he ever seen as a threat to your power? If God calls
calls on you in your life to do certain things. If he calls on you to live your life in a certain way, not the way you want, but the way he wants. If he calls on you to surrender, to surrender your will to follow his. If he calls on you to surrender your time or your money for his purposes. If he calls on you to surrender your life to walk with and worship him. Is Jesus proving to be a threat to you? Is he a threat to your power? What would you do with him in the midst of this big power struggle? Well, before you answer, let's remind ourselves again of who Jesus is. We read this before, right, in the book of Colossians. Think about who he is. He's the image of the invisible God. God is a spirit. He doesn't have a physical shape. But God showed himself in the person of Jesus. Jesus is God. For him, all things were created. Can you imagine the irony of this situation for Jesus, the Son of God? The Jews are fighting over him. The Romans are fighting over him. They're both deciding our lives would be better off without Jesus around because we want the power. But Jesus created them. He brought them to life. He sustained them. He fed them every day. Who really has the power in this situation? And not only does Colossians say that, but it says all things were created by him and for him. Think about that when you look around the world. Everything was created, was created for Jesus' purposes. And here are these people deciding we need to be in power. Our lives would be a whole lot better if Jesus weren't around. This is an amazing thing, isn't it? Because Jesus is the one who has the power. Now, let's get all the way back to where we started. How did Jesus use his power? He gave it up. He gave up his power. He allowed the people whom he created, whom he watched over, whom he fed every day, to take his life. And at the moment when he looked the weakest, that's when he unsheathed his power. The power that no person has, that no sword can wield, that no government can even talk about. He showed the true depth of his power when he said this. Today you'll be with me in paradise. To this man dying on the cross, to this repentant thief, to this repentant thief who, whom the world said, you don't even deserve to live anymore. You're not worthy of the earth. You need to go. To this man, not judged to have any worth to even live on earth. Jesus said, you get to go to heaven. You get to 
be with me in paradise forever. That's the power. Jesus' power to forgive sins and to save people. Everybody missed it. Everybody else around there was saying, our lives would be a whole lot better if Jesus weren't around. Except for this man who said, Jesus, I want to be with you in paradise. Can you forgive me for my life? For the things that I've done? Can you wash away my sins? And right there in front of his eyes, Jesus was doing it. There's the power that no person has, that no government has. That no amount of money, no amount of guns, no amount of military uh, might, and no amount of fight can provide for you and me. But Jesus does. And he does it freely. To you and for me. When we come to him in humble repentance and really recognize who's king around here? How does Jesus use his power? He hides his power and he dies for those thieves. He hides his power and he dies for those mocking Roman guards and for Pilate who washed his hands of Jesus. He hides his power and dies for the Jews who nearly created a riot and paid off one of his own disciples. And how does Jesus use his power? He hides his power and he dies for you. As we listen to this lesson, there's a lot of people today saying, our lives would be a whole lot better if Jesus weren't around. He is infringing on our power. He's getting in the way. We'd be better off if he were just dead. But what about you? What do you think about Jesus today? Do we instead find ourselves more like that thief on the cross saying, Lord, we recognize who you are. You're the Savior. You're the King. Would you mind remembering me when you come into your kingdom? And to think that Jesus would say to you, you'll be with me in paradise. If he were to say that, that'd change your whole life, wouldn't it? That would change this whole world filled with a lot of crummy junk. You'd have a whole different way of looking at, at yourself and the world and why you're here and where you're going. If Jesus would only say that to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Wow. And he does. <laughs> and he did. Sometimes we call Jesus the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to help us to remember who he really is. Because there's a lot of talk about government and power and money and might. And if we're not careful, we'll get caught up in all that too. Now it's important. For earth, it's important. But we might just get
get caught up in that ourselves. We just sang the hymn, Crown Them With Many Crowns. That head that was adorned with a crown of thorns. Today, to the crown of glory. Some days on earth, our heads are filled also with a, a crown of thorns, in a sense. As we deal with the problems and troubles of this evil world, but listen again to what Jesus promises. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Bow your knee and your heart to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's coming soon to take his people to be with him. To take you. Amen.